All right, good evening, everyone. Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Brain Health. And tonight I am talking about POTS question and answer. So we've received some really great questions and uh, I'm going to go through them. And hopefully these questions may apply to you. And if you have other questions, let me know. Uh, and then we will, without further ado, we'll start it off from there. So let me see here. <clears throat> okay. Again, Gates Brain Health, Reno, Nevada. And so the first question with POTS is, how does it work to have a high fluid volume but low plasma and why? So basically, as you increase more water, or as you increase the amount of water that you're drinking, you're going to have a tendency to have basically lower solute in your plasma. So it's just kind of like... You put some sugar in your iced tea, and then you get a glass that's twice the size of the current glass, and you put more iced tea in that glass and dump your current glass in there. So basically, you're going to have a lot of iced tea and very little sugar. And so that's kind of the example of when POTS patients start doing fluid loading, where they're starting to drink 120 ounces of water a day or so, or maybe 100 ounces of water, but they're not adequately adjusting their salt intake, then there's going to be a tendency for them to have a really high fluid volume, but basically a low solute level in their plasma. And that's why it's important in terms of the management strategies for POTS to also be integrating salt per the direction of your doctor. I'm not telling you to increase salt into your diet or to fluid load. I just talk about general recommendations. But basically, as one is loading the fluid volume, we also want to increase the solute in the blood by increasing salt consumption. So that's basically the answer to that. And here I have a wonderful diagram of the autonomic nervous system. <clears throat> I think this is really great for all POTS patients to keep studying because it exemplifies the sympathetic chain ganglia it exemplifies how the autonomic nervous system between fight flight and also the rest and digest responses really innervate most organs in our body, including, you know, areas of our body like our pupil or the hair in the back of our neck and also our kidneys and our vasculature. So very, very, very important. Why is there less blood going to the kidneys? Because the blood has fallen to the lower extremities, question mark. So when I use the kidney example, I was using the kidney example as, as a model for how the body regulates blood pressure. So, but this also does apply to POTS. So I use the example of if you were to cut an artery in my arm and that artery was starting to spew out blood, my fluid volume is going to go down. When my fluid volume goes down, my kidneys are one of the key areas in the body that are going to sense this fluid volume has changed. When that happens and there's less blood basically going through um, this thing called the juxtacomerular apparatus, then you're going to start to have renin being produced, and then that renin is going to go to your liver and cause a cleavage of angiotensinogen, or cause a conversion, excuse me, of angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. Then angiotensin 1 is going to float around and primarily be converted in your lungs to angiotensin 2. And angiotensin 2 really helps to vasoconstrict your blood vessels. It also works with aldosterone signaling. Aldosterone, again, is a mineral corticoid from your adrenal glands which helps to save sodium back into your bloodstream. So basically, simply, you cut an artery in your arm, blood volume goes down, your kidney senses it. It enacts chemicals that are really going to cause vasoconstriction, so tightening of the arteries, as well as, hey, let's save sodium back into the bloodstream. So that's really what the kidneys are doing. Now, for a POTS patient, here part of the second question, because the blood has fallen to the lower extremities. So in POTS patients, yeah, most of the, we're having excessive fluid down in the lower extremities. And when that happens, and yes, the kidneys are going to have some sense that maybe there's an abnormal uh, amount of blood flowing through them, and that can enact some of these reflexes that I just mentioned. But again, the principal cause of POTS and the principal problem of POTS is autoimmunity. Go back and watch POTS and autoimmunity part two. I think that's 
the best description of because 89% of POTS patients have antibodies to adrenaline receptors. 53% have antibodies to acetylcholine receptors. And so that's really the reason, based on the current literature, for the blood staying in the lower extremities. And while there may be compensatory effects in the kidney, um, <clears throat> the autoimmunity really seems to be the underlying cause or progenitor of this condition we call POTS. Why do you not focus more on the vagus nerve when many other practitioners focus more heavily on this? That answer is kind of twofold. So I've done a lot of vagal nerve stimulation techniques with my patients throughout the years. They have not been as profound in my experience as a lot of other practitioners report. I feel that these vagal nerve stimulation techniques, which have been popularized at like these autoimmune summits that a lot of patients go ahead and watch. Um, again, they may be kind of effective, but I haven't found them to be extremely effective for just as a carte blanche recommendation. Some of these, for those of you who don't know what vagal nerve simulation can be, it can be something like humming, it can be gargling, air or water. Uh, some people are now doing, I think one, one device was called like the de novo or something to that effect where you basically do electrical stimulation or it can be an implanted device into the, the tragus or a part of the ear. Um, that's what I've seen being done. Some of these devices seem to have a lot of side effects. So that's my experience with vagal nerve stimulation. Again, if you were <clears throat> to be able to profoundly stimulate the vagus nerve, what is going to happen? Again, the vagus nerve going back here, you can see the vagus nerve and how it innervates the heart, the, excuse me, the lungs, the heart. It does affect the liver. It affects your gastrointestinal organs. It affects basically your intestines and the first third of your colon. So the vagus nerve has a large distribution to our anatomy, and it can have the effect to oppose the fight-flight response. Simply, POTS is a condition of excessive fight-flight, ironically, lots of times because of an autoantibodies to chemicals which are part of the fight-flight system, if that makes sense. So by stimulating the vagus nerve, then yeah, theoretically, you have a chance to calm down your heart rate and you have a chance to kind of reset the tone to these organs. But again, how long is that going to last? because it's an autoimmune condition, again, interfering with these natural reflex loops. And so do you want to band-aid or do you want to get to the root cause? The root cause is trying to calm down this autoimmunity and then retraining your vascular system so it can basically compensate for what's happened and work normally. So that is my take on it. Um, I attached this article, Vagal Nerve Stimulation is Beneficial in Postural Orthostatic Tachycardia Syndrome and Epilepsy. Now, this is from the journal Seizure, but this was not really a, a study where they were looking at a number of patients where they did vagal nerve stimulation and found it to be robustly effective. Also, keep in mind when you read about vagal nerve stimulation, lots of times these are vagal nerve stimulators that are implanted. And implanted devices, you know, when I would just say good luck for a lot of patients and practitioners trying to find a neurosurgeon who's going to do a vagal nerve stimulation as just kind of a you know, something that's not really FDA approved perhaps for POTS. I'd have to check on that, but I haven't really heard about that routinely being done. There's actually not a lot of literature on this. For example, if you uh, PubMed search vagal nerve stimulation on POTS, I think 15 articles come up, but not a lot were actually pertaining to that issue. If you type in vagus nerve and POTS, I think it's like six articles, or maybe it's vice versa. So, this is one of the more definitive studies I found. So again, a lot of practitioners are talking about this. Doesn't necessarily mean that that's the end all be all treatment for POTS. When we look at the totality of literature on this condition, again, most is pointing towards the autoimmune component. And I will say, years ago, I've been talking about small fiber neuropathy. I even did a recent broadcast on small fiber neuropathy and POTS. Uh, and how neuropathy can be a component. I think at this point that really whatever signs and symptoms clinicians were seeing of small fiber neuropathy is probably more a manifestation of this autoimmune component to acetylcholine receptors, which involve the small fiber nerves, 
or to adrenaline receptors, which can also have some impact on how the small fiber nerves for the sympathetic postganglionics are functioning. So <clears throat> POTS in pregnancy. Do POTS symptoms go into remission like Hashi's during pregnancy or no? Hashi is referring to Hashimoto's. Um, basically, in pregnancy, fluid volume tends to increase. That's why people have a lot of swelling. That's why carpal tunnel syndrome is so common in pregnancy. When I did a literature search on this, they basically say that POTS does not seem to uh, increase any risk of, of, of problems during pregnancy, but there wasn't a lot of data regarding symptoms of POTS patients during pregnancy. I would surmise that, and maybe all of you can let me know, for those POTS patients who have been pregnant, let me know if you're pregnant and did you feel better or worse. Uh, some autoimmune conditions will feel better in pregnancy um, because uh, basically we have what's called a Th1, Th2 system. It's way more complicated than that, but basically one side of your immune system is like the Marine Corps, one side's like the Air Force. In pregnancy, we tend to have vacillation of those two sides of the immune system, particularly we become Th2 dominant in the third trimester, and sometimes that will help autoimmune symptoms. I would also, again, surmise that the increase in fluid volume during pregnancy may help POTS symptoms, but I can't really give you a solid reference on that. I was reading a presentation uh, regarding a group of doctors on POTS, and they recommended as you do swimming, recumbent biking and rowing, but also aerobic as as well as some resistance training focused on the thighs. Why the thighs? Um, because in your thighs is where a lot of fluid volume is gonna be located. It's not uncommon for people to have blood clots in their thighs. You can have blood clots in your calf muscle. That's where most people think of getting them, but you can also get blood clots in your thighs. You have a lot of fluid there. And so by doing you know, some resistance training focus on the thighs, that's gonna do what? It's gonna contract the muscles. When you contract those muscles, you're gonna put a lot of pressure on that blood to go back up to the heart. And I think that's their impetus for focusing on the thighs as much as anything. So that's what I would say relative to that. So those are my questions. Thank you all for listening. Uh, if you have any other thoughts, send them to the info at gatesbrainhealth.com, post them on the YouTube channel, give us a call at the number listed here. And let me go back to Facebook and just see if we have anybody else chiming in on their questions. And it looks like we're good. So again, let me know if anything comes up. But otherwise, thank you all for watching and have a lovely, lovely evening.